Welcome to CSW 186, Introduction to Database Systems. I'm Joe Hellerstein. I think that a professor of a class should be able to answer some basic queries for you before you go through all the work of taking the class. So here's the basic queries I'd like to answer in today's lecture. Why take this class? What is the class all about? Who is running it? And how will the class work? We'll start with why. Uh, the first and most important reason, I think, is utility. This class is very, very useful. Data processing backs essentially every application you can think of. And database systems of one form or another are running back there behind those applications to do that data management. And so in that sense, the principles taught in this class back nearly everything you'll want to do in computing. So an example of a query you can ask is, where shall I eat database? And uh, the Yelp application is an application over a database that might be able to help answer that query. Uh, Yelp not only allows queries, it also allows you to enter data into the database, things like rating stars and reviews. Now this data has an enormous effect on the real world. A Harvard Business School study back in 2011 found that each rating star added on a Yelp restaurant review translated to anywhere from a 5% to a 9% effect on revenues. So databases can be quite important in the real world. Be kind when you enter data into the database and think about those local business owners who are operating the restaurants near where you go to school. You can also ask, what am I missing out on database? So on the left, we have a screenshot of Instagram that was posted, in fact, on Instagram's page by uh, their marketing department. On the right, you see the kinds of statistics that can be queried from Instagram if you're uh, subscribing for their analytics service. So you can find out, for example, how many followers you have what's the gender breakdown, the age breakdown, locations, and uh, their following over time. These are all analytics queries that you can ask on that database, which is mostly about people trying to make sure that they don't have fear of missing out. Now, if you look at this photo, just as a side comment, you zoom in, it says, literally can't think of a better day in San Francisco. So the folks at Instagram posted this, but those of us here at Berkeley know that that picture right there is actually the Chez Panisse restaurant here in Berkeley, which is a very famous and very delicious place to go have food. I encourage you to come to Berkeley and try it sometime. Another thing that databases can be used for is to figure out who should I be with, All right, And in this sense, uh, this is the Tinder app, of course, databases are important for the happiness and the promulgation of the human race. Okay, so, uh, Tinder provides some basic statistics about the use of their service, some recent information from them. 1.6 billion swipes per day are handled by Twitter. That's a lot of data being inserted into their database. 1 million dates happen per week, and 20 billion plus total matches were made with Tinder. Okay, so this data has a really profound effect on our world. Now on a more serious note, science increasingly is being done through databases. The photo here is of a man named Jim Gray. Uh, he was the he is a Turing Award winner and was the first PhD to get a computer science PhD at UC Berkeley. So we're very proud of him. Late in his life, he became involved in the work on what he was then calling e-science, or what he more famously called the fourth paradigm of science. So let me take you through a little bit of what Gray was talking about. He said, look, the first paradigm of science was experimental, um, basically interacting with the real world and seeing what happens. It's part of basic human nature and it's been going on since the beginning of time. Uh, theoretical science was a second paradigm, and it's one that goes back at least to the ancient Greeks and astronomy, uh, but the idea of using mathematical modeling to try to figure out what's going on in the real world. In the 20th century, we had a new paradigm for science, simulation, the ability to use lots of computers and a model to try to model and predict what is happening in the physical world. Gray was talking about a fourth paradigm of science, which is data intensive science, where you use sensing and large data storage to be able to understand what's going on in the real world, but study it essentially offline through the data. So in this example of the fourth paradigm, Gray got involved with what was called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was an effort to photograph the entire sky using telescopes and store that data in database systems. And they built a system on top of that, this is Gray and a bunch of astronomers, called Sky Server, and it was hosted by Microsoft. It's still available today as part of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And you can see here how you navigate through Sky Server, and you can look at uh, uh, things that are out there in the universe and what we can see about them and what we know about them. So it's quite interesting. And they've extended the use of Sky, of Sky, Sky Server to what they call Sci Server. You can see the pun there. Um, moving not only from astronomy, but also to things like connectomics, which is the study of the structure of the brain. 
cosmological physics, genomics, oceanography, and so on. So these are all examples where data is being sensed by devices, being stored in databases, and then the science happens in the analysis of that data. In your career now, bringing this back home, things about data will be very important and will also offer you significant opportunity. So in the 2000s, there was a shift from uh, people in computer science writing programs to people writing applications over data-centric services. As we've said before, today, it's hard to imagine applications that are divorced from data and backend storage. More recently, what we've seen is that the idea of a full-stack programmer, someone who works on every aspect of a computer program, is becoming increasingly obsolete as specializations in computer science become deeper and deeper. So there are new ubiquitous professions focused on the data side of computation. Uh, professions with titles like data scientist or data engineer or machine learning engineer. Right? These are all things where you want to have a deep understanding of data and how to manage it in order to be able to do your branch of computing. This is also true in the IT field, where in IT, there used to be people who were in charge of the entire data center and all its operations. Increasingly, operations are being handled in the cloud, and data management and data curation is a remaining task for IT and a specialization that lasts even as data moves off premises and into the cloud. Regardless of how things change, here are a couple things that I want to acknowledge about this class. The first is that the fundamentals of the course, I believe, will stay central to your career throughout the career. Data is not going away. It will, it's an increasingly important part of computing. It will always be there. But other things will change. Many of the details in this class are specific to today's technology. It's important that you're able to generalize from the examples we look at with current technology to things you'll be doing in the future that use the same principles. Okay, so we'll try to highlight the principles, but we are going to give you hands-on with current technologies and give you a sense of, hopefully, how things might evolve. But in the end, you're the folks who are going to be evolving the technology yourselves. You are the next generation of innovation. So be prepared to generalize from what you learn here. And of course, to keep learning new things peripheral to these basics that allow you to move forward. OK, so in sum, reason number one to take this class, utility. This material will empower you to be a better uh, compensated employee and also a smarter computer scientist for the future. Another reason to take this class is the centrality of data management to modern society. Data really is at the center of modern society. Data is very interesting. It's sort of unprecedented in its nature and its significance because data is both very particular, lots of little pieces of data, each of which has its own importance, and voluminous. There's so very much data. And this is often asymmetric. So a fact about you might be low value in isolation. You might, for example, not care or not be able to price the value of your shopping patterns at the grocery store. But this is very high value and aggregated. If the grocery store can get the shopping patterns of many, many people in your region, then they can save money and earn more money by figuring out what to stock in your neighborhood. Okay, And so this asymmetry of the value of data makes it very complicated to figure out as an economic good. It's really quite a different thing that we've seen before in most of the sort of media and materials that we've worked with over time. Of course, another aspect of data, which we won't get a lot of time to talk about in this class, is security. Data is very difficult to protect. It's very fluid. It's very easy not only to move, but also to copy. And this makes it very complicated uh, to enforce protections over this data. Okay, so data is very central to discussions of what's going on in modern society as a result of these kinds of issues. It's at the center of major issues in our discourse, things like privacy and national security and fake news. So let me talk through these one at a time. Privacy is one that is kind of amazing to me. When I started working in databases, nobody was really very interested in them. They were sort of a functional thing that people needed for business. But starting in the mid-2000s, we started to see the word database appearing on the front page of newspapers, which was really quite surprising and kind of cool in a way at the time. It's just that somehow we've become relevant after all these years working on databases. Um, but often when database was on the front page, it wasn't in a good way. And of course, that's only multiplied in recent years, uh, data and databases appearing on the front page of the newspaper on a weekly or even daily basis, usually in a negative form. Okay, So data is obviously very important, and databases are very important to the functioning of society, just as illustrated by the news. 
Now, when you think about its personal effect on you, here's an excerpt from an article in The Guardian called, Are You Ready? Here's All the Data That Facebook and Google, Google Have on You. And it's a bit of an alarmist article. Google knows where you've been. Google knows everything you've ever searched and deleted. Google has an advertisement profile of you. Google knows all the apps you use. It has all of your YouTube history. Facebook stores everything from your stickers to your login location, and they can access your webcam and microphone. Google knows which events you attended and when. Google can know your workout routine. They have years worth of your photos. And Google has every email you've ever sent. Well, that's a lot of stuff. And it sounds like it could be scary. But the truth is, many of us operate with these services. And it really hasn't had an enormous personal effect in our lives. But then the article has the following quote, which I thought was perhaps the most interesting part of it. Managed to gain access to someone's Google account? Perfect. You have a diary of everything that person has done. It's really quite phenomenal, actually, not just what's known to those companies, but how that creates one locus of risk for you and your privacy, right? So these are issues that we're still wrestling with in modern society, but they're enabled by the technologies for data management that we're going to learn about in this class. Now, turning to national security, and I'll focus here on the United States only because this is what I know best, but if you're watching this in another country, there may be equivalent or even more impressive slash scary things going on in your country. This is an infographic. It's quite old now. It's from 2010. And even back then, and you can think about how many doublings of technology we've had since Moore's Law, since then because of Moore's Law. But even back then in 2010, look at how much data the National Security Agency in the U.S. was get, looking at daily. At that time, they were looking at 1.6% of total internet traffic, which was 26 petabytes a day. That's actually quite a lot, even by today's standards. And at that time, comparing it to Google, they said that Google at that time had indexed only 0.004% of the data on the net, and therefore NSA's daily data collection was 400 Googles at that time, or 126 Facebooks, or 6.5 million DVD movies at Netflix. So the NSA was looking at data at a scale well beyond what they were storing at these cloud services that we tend to think of as the biggest and most impressive data sources. Okay, so this is possible in essence because the government can solicit uh, information from the pipes that connect our data sources together, right? They can get data from the communications providers. And as the data flows by, they're able to access it. So enormous volumes of data being employed for national security. Now, that's not to say that they get to do whatever they want with the data. Here in the United States, there are laws about when uh, the uh, National Security Agency can use this data for government purposes. So here's an example from 2018. The government got a court order to allow them to target 42 suspicious people who were uh, at risk of causing real harm here in the United States. In order to target those 42 people, though, they made a case to collect over 151 million call detail records. Okay, so even though the target was small, the net that was cast in the data was very, very large. And this raises a lot of questions about what's the right thing to do here. Is it okay that all that data was brought to bear on such a small uh, set of targets? Is it possible to be secure and use that data without looking at so much of it? Uh, these are interesting and important questions. And some of the things you'll learn in this class will help you reason about these questions. Another issue that's come up in recent years that's quite complex and uh, brand new, really, is this issue of data integrity and the sense that not all data is correct. Now, that idea is not, of course, new, but its implications for society broadly seem to be quite new. This goes back, in my mind, to, uh, at least in popular culture, to an uh, episode of what was then called the Colbert Report. So this is comedian Stephen Colbert when he was on Comedy Central, had his show, and he played a character of a news reporter who was very right-wing. And he had stumbled across this new phenomenon called Wikipedia, and he had learned that uh, if any user can change any entry in this, in this encyclopedia, and if enough users agree with them, it becomes true. And to make his point, Colbert said on his TV show that there are too many elephants in Africa and that it wasn't true that they were endangered. And he asked the viewers of his show to reflect a tripling population on the Wikipedia page for elephants. And of course, as a joke, many of his viewers did this, and Wikipedia actually had to lock down the elephant page for a while in order to avoid it being filled with false information. Uh, and it was very interesting. He later on had Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, on the show to uh, discuss these phenomena. It's both funny and thought-provoking. But it all seemed like a good laugh back in 20, 
2007. And interestingly, a 2005 Nature study had already found that Wikipedia Science articles were similar in accuracy to Encyclopedia Britannica. So something about Wikipedia works, works pretty well, despite a little mischief making by folks like Colbert. Uh, and so it seemed, at least at that time, that this was an amusing anecdote, but basically that common access to data would allow the information to become more correct. Fast forward to 2018 and all the discussion we're having in politics these days worldwide about uh, what Donald Trump would call in America fake news. And you may remember that Trump in 2017, or sorry, early 2018, had started uh, an idea of having an award for the most dishonest and corrupt media. So again, Stephen Colbert, now on The Late Show, took out ads in the newspapers and on billboards in New York Times nominating himself for most dishonest and corrupt media awards as a way of calling uh, out how sort of absurd this idea was. But we really are in a dialogue in our political discourse right now about how we get to the truth of news and how information spreads and what data we can trust. And this is a conversation that's both political and quite a bit technical in terms of how do we control the flow of information and how do we uh, validate and verify its sources and its veracity. So there's a very interesting conversation about data quality that's going on. We'll touch on that a little bit in this class, though perhaps not in the way that it's come out in the news today. Um, I guess the syllogism of quotes that I want you to remember from all this, Albert Einstein said information is knowledge. Sir Francis Bacon said knowledge is power. And with great power comes great responsibility. That's a quote from Spider-Man's Uncle Ben. Uh, and with these three things put together, you'll see that understanding this stuff is really very important uh, for our society. And people who understand this have an important role to play in our uh, civil discourse. Now, this has not escaped the attention of data science leaders around the world. Um, so this example is a Medium post from DJ Patil. DJ was the first chief data scientist of the United States under Barack Obama. And actually, uh, that role hasn't been filled under Trump. So he's so far the only chief data scientist of the United States. So sometime about a year ago, he posted a code of ethics for data science, or rather an article calling for such a code to be created by the community. And I won't read the entire blurb here out, but the main point at the end is this one. There is no single voice that determines the choices of what data is uh, 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 being used and how it should be used. This must be a community effort. And so he led a call for many people to get together and start working on this idea of a code of ethics for data sciences. Here at Berkeley, we have a new data science major and we're taking this very much to heart. So as part of that major, we have an explicit focus and requirement on human contexts and ethics as courses that you have to take to satisfy the major. And we have scholars from all over the campus teaching courses that satisfy this requirement, not just technologists, in fact, especially not technologists in many cases, um, but that marriage of technology requirements and ethics requirements is a key part of how we view data science here at Berkeley. Okay, so summing up, reason number two for why to take this call, of course, the centrality of data is key to the importance of the class. This class is about data infrastructure, and fundamentally, the infrastructure determines what's possible. If you want to have a knowledgeable and authoritative conversation about data and its role in society, it's important to understand how this infrastructure works. A third reason to take this class is, in some sense, it is the core of modern computing. Data growth continues to grow and outpace the growth of computing, so there's more data faster than there's faster processors. And systems for data at scale, therefore, are increasingly the core of what we're doing with computer science. Think about any of your uh, most used online services. They all are systems for data at scale. So Domo, which is a software company in the data analytics space, puts out a... Uh, uh, infographic every year. This is the 2018 edition, and I'll just highlight some of the interesting things that they've cited here about how much data gets generated every minute. The Weather Channel receives 18 million forecast requests, 18 million queries for the weather every minute. Very likely because a lot of devices automatically ping it. Twitter users send 473,000 tweets every minute. That's human-generated data. And then on the lower left, Google conducts 3.8 million searches. That's human-generated searches every day, every minute, excuse me. So it's really, it's, it's, it's even hard to keep track when I'm making this video of just how much volume of data and queries is going on. Really quite phenomenal. And it grows year after year. Scientific data is probably the largest scale data that we have on the planet today. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN 
gathers in raw data 19 zettabytes a year. And you can look on the upper right here of a table of the prefixes for uh, uh, numbers that are used in common parlance. You're probably familiar with kilobytes and megabytes and gigabytes, but you may not have heard of zettabytes or even bigger, a thousand times bigger, yottabytes. Okay. So the Large Hadron Collider, it collects 19 zettabytes a year, but it downsamples it to about 788 petabytes a year, which is still a pretty enormous number. And then that is downsampled further for storage to 33 petabytes a year. So I assure you that at over time, they will store as much of this as they possibly can. But in the meantime, the ability to generate data is really unlimited. So why are all these forces driving data growth? Well, enabling check technologies are important. So there's cheap, scalable data management systems. The technologies we're going to learn about in this class are getting faster, cheaper, better, year over year with new innovations and riding technology curves. In addition, similar technology curves are driving ubiquitous sensing and reporting. So there's increasing deployment of cameras. Mobile computing makes it possible for people to be traced and tracked as they move around in the real world. And it also allows them to enter data all over the place and incentivizes them to do so. It gives them reasons for entering data, for reviews, for check-ins, and so on. And even, you know, sort of just platforms like blogging and tweeting allow people to just have their say all the time. So this notion of ubiquitous sensing and reporting is really growing data growth. And then the large collaborative data science projects, obviously, excuse me, the large collaborative science projects, don't mind data science, this is hard science, are generating, as we saw, enormous data. And the philosophy for many people who have titles like Chief Technology Officer, Chief Information Officer, Chief Data Officer, is that more data implies more value. So companies increasingly are just saving all the data in hopes that data scientists will be able to extract value from that data. All right, And that may be the job that many of you uh, go and take after uh, watching this class, is to work on the data engineering and data science to make value out of all that data. So in sum, the third reason to take this class, it is the core of computing. The techniques you learn in this class underlie many topics in computing, particularly computing at large scale.